Now, if you got your Bibles, you're going to want to get them out. Um, if you have them digitally, if you have the paper one, whatever kind, uh, get into that. You can turn to Galatians chapter 3 is where we're going to be in just a moment. So let me start off by kind of explaining this. On December 24th, we had our Christmas Eve services that morning. And after each service, we had our groundbreaking for a new building. And it was, it was so much fun. And uh, that afternoon, I, I, along with several other people, we got home. And how many of you guys got sick over the holidays? Yeah, I'm with you. And so, man, I got hit hard by Christmas morning. I was just like, I don't care about any of this. Like, it was just a bad time. And then went through that for about the next six days, and it's still hanging on with me. And it was just a frustration. The cool part is I got to sit in bed and just watch a lot of TV. So it was really fun from that perspective. Now, during the same time, one of our church members was going out of town, and he approached me. He has a vehicle. It's, it's an Audi A7. Now, that doesn't mean anything to me. If you're a car guy, it may mean something to you. What I can tell you is that it is substantially different than my 2006 pickup truck. <laughs> and so I got to, when I was well enough to get out and do stuff, I got to get into the Audi A7. Now, this car is amazing. I would sit down, and it would know stuff about me. It was, it was incredible. And as you drive down the road, it would do, like, when you would turn it on, screens would pop out of different places, and I'm just like, this is amazing. And then you drive along, and it tells you when there's an idiot driver next to you that's getting too close to you, like you're driving down the road, and the car is just like, Jason, there's a moron to your left. And you're like, oh, man, that's amazing. And he doesn't use that exact voice, but it's pretty cool. And so it was just like, it's communicating stuff to me. I'm like, this is so cool. And it hit me like, somebody invented that. Like somebody sat in a place somewhere and like that's what they did with their life and time. And now when they drive around that car or their friend drives that car, they have to go, hey, you know that thing? <laughs> I did that. And then I, when I got feeling better, we started going to a movie, movies. Well, you guys have been here long at all. You'll know I'm a movie nut. Well, I ran across a movie that I fell in love with. It's called The Greatest Showman. And if there's any fans in here, if you don't, if you've not seen it, you need to listen Get right with the Lord. Go see it today, all right? So it is such a good movie. I've seen it three times now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's real. It was incredible. And I'm watching this show, and it's got all this amazing music and choreography and everything. And I'm watching that going, that's what they did with their life for, like, months. And now, like, everybody see, And it's just, that's incredible. And so I don't know about you, but every time I experience something incredible, like in the Audi, or, or I see something incredible, like in the show, there's a part of me that goes... What am I doing with my life? Like, I just watched nine straight hours of the second season of Stranger Things, but that's about all I've piled up in the last week. And some of you may go, why would you watch that? Because it's awesome. And, but it was just, it was like, what, what am I doing with my life? And I don't know about you, but I sometimes have that thought in general. Like, where's this going? What impact am I making on the world? And so, when you ask that question, there's really... Three important questions that you have to ask yourself in your life when you start to think like that. And the first one is this. Who am I right now? So we always have this destination we want to reach for. But the question is, where am I starting from? Who am I right now? Who am I in my marriage? Who am I at my work? Who am I in my neighborhood? Who am I in my marriage? Who am I spiritually? And then the next question is, who do I want to be? Well, what do I want my financial life to look like? What do I want my marriage to look like? What do I want my spiritual life to look like? And then the, the thing you have to, to look at is go, is there a gap between who I am and who I want to be? And if there's some space that you need to travel there, the third question is, how do I get there? How do I make that jump to get to that place? Because the honest truth is, and I ask this of people all the time, I will sit there with people and they'll go, are you today in a different place than you were a year ago spiritually? And most people will say no. But they want it to be. The problem is they didn't figure out how to travel from one spot to another. And so if you go, man, I want to be a better friend. So what kind of friend am I now? What kind of friend do I want to be? And how do I get there? What kind of a husband or a wife am I now? What do I want to be? And how do I get there? And the most important one, what do I want my spiritual, what does my spiritual life look like now? What do I want it to be? And how 
do I get there? And a lot of us, when we hear that, we go, man, I need to do so many things different in my spiritual life. Jason, you don't even know. Like your brain starts to fill up and you get that analysis paralysis start going on. Like you have so many options that you just go, I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to do nothing because I don't even know where to start. Well, we're going to, that's what this series is all about. It's giving you starting places to begin moving down that trajectory. But a couple of things I want to address up front. First, don't confuse status with growth. This is a huge, huge issue when we start talking about spiritual growth for people. <clears throat> Let me define these two things for you. There is status. Your status is who God says you are. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you, you are sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit. You don't jump in and out of God's grace. It is a done deal, and your status is fixed. Come on, it's 930, sir. Y'all supposed to be a lot more awake. Like, that is good news, amen? All right, that is exciting stuff. So I don't have to worry about my status of being Christian or not a Christian changing because my salvation isn't based on my activities or my behaviors. My salvation is based on the activity of Jesus Christ for me. And so that's my status. Then there's growth. And growth is simply, who am I becoming in Christ? See, if you go to Crossroads, we do not want to stop at just helping you meet Jesus. We would like to see your life transformed by Him. So we want you to get the status, but we also want you to get growth. We want you not only to accept Christ as your Savior, but begin to let Him impact how you think, how you live, how, how, you, how you interact in relationships, all those things. We want to see your life changed. And so there's this thing that seems to be a conflict, but it's really not. But Paul has to address it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21. He says this, is there a conflict then between God's law, God's law is for our growth, so God gives us laws, He gives us rules of how to live by so that we can live like Christ. Is there a conflict between God's law and God's promise, which is His the status, it's what God promises in our life. And Paul says, absolutely not. If the law could give us a new life, then we could made, be made right by God by obeying it. He says, this isn't based on your performance or your behaviors. If you could be made right by simply obeying the law, then, well, then, then we, you wouldn't need Jesus. He says those are there for a different purpose. He says this, but the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. And so we receive God's promise, status of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. And so there is no tension between these two. What he's saying is nothing you could ever do could make God love you any more or any less. And so he's saying, don't keep score. Don't live your life on a set of scales trying to go, if I do more good than bad, then in the end I'll get to heaven. He's saying, don't keep score. But he's also saying, don't use grace as an excuse not to grow either. Yeah. That's what we need to understand. And so the first thing is, don't confuse status with growth. The second thing I want you to, to kind of warn you about is don't fall into the comparison trap. Here's what, here's what I mean by that. We've all seen this illustration before. You've seen the illustration of the iceberg. You've got 10% on the top, 90% of an iceberg is underneath. That's how we tend to view other people's lives. We see the top 10% of what they, um, what they are, and, and we start to make assumptions. Like you see, you look at them and you go, man, they're so successful. Everything came easy for them. Or you look at them and you see that top 10% and you go, their kids just are always behaving. I mean, that's not even fair. Our kids are messed up. Their kids are good. Or they look and they go, man, uh, that, you know, God seems to speak to them, but God's not speaking to me at all. Why does this person seem to be so great spiritually? Or, man, look at that marriage. Their marriage is so cute and good. It just makes me want to throw up. <laughs> we see that top 10%. We make assumptions and we start to compare our life to it. The truth is we need to understand there's 90% under the surface, which means this. Whether it's a marriage, relationship, finances, or your spiritual life, what you're not seeing is you're not seeing the valleys they've gone through. Yep. You're not seeing the work. You're not seeing the, the mornings and the evenings with knees on the floor. You're not seeing the days with the Bible open, struggling to understand the Word of God for themselves. But I guarantee you, if you see somebody that is living a full spiritual life, those moments exist. Mm -hmm. It's work. The behind the scenes. So how do I grow? 
Well, back to Galatians chapter 3, look at verse 27. And I love this. He says, all, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. And really, it's, the word there is it's comfortable clothes. So let me ask you a question. Why do we wear clothes? Okay, okay so, so you hit on a couple. First of all, like it gets cold. We wear we, for protection, for warmth, right? For modesty, amen? amen? How many of you are really grateful the person next to you is not naked right now? Like, how many, like just look, turn and look at them and say, thank you for not being naked today. I appreciate that. Okay. We are grateful. And so there's practical reasons that we wear clothes. There's also, have you ever worn clothes for any other reason? Sure, we all have. You get dressed up sometimes, kind of want to impress somebody. You're going out someplace fancy. Sometimes, and, and women, I don't understand this, but it happens to guys too. Sometimes we'll even put stuff on that's uncomfortable just because it's cute. And you go, man, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer for this outfit today. These shoes, shoes are amazing. Can I get a piggyback ride? No, you can't. You made a dumb call. That's not my fault. Oh, yeah, right. So here's the difference. You can dress for practical living, or you can dress to manage appearances. So there's two different reasons that you get dressed in the morning. And when he says, I want you to put God on, or put me on like you're putting on comfortable clothes, here's the best way I can describe that to you. How many of you, and I know particularly women in this room, I know exactly what I'm talking about. How many of you, when you get home from work, there's that thing that you put on and you can't wait to get into it? Yeah, and I'm going to tell you, and gentlemen, you know this, it ain't sexy. Okay? Like, when it goes on, you know other stuff has gone out the window. Like, it's, like you go, man, that is some comfortable clothes. And it's, it's not, listen, it's just your daily stuff. You go, man, I could just live life in these clothes. It's comfortable. It's relaxing. It's practical for what I need to do. I can run around my house, do whatever I got to do. I'm probably not going to go out in public, but, man, I can live in this outfit right here and feel comfortable. That's the image that God is giving us in this verse. He's saying, I don't want you to, to put me on and manage appearances. We do that. When we play church, we play Christianity. He says, I want to be the daily thing that you're wearing that makes you comfortable. The thing that you, it's not a managed appearance. Because here's the thing. He wants this daily stuff because our biggest breakthroughs, our biggest accomplishments in our life, our biggest spiritual growth typically will never happen overnight. If you're going to get wealthy one day, it's probably not going to be by winning the lottery. If your marriage is going to look great next year, it's not going to be because you planned one great date night. Those are wonderful things. But more often than not, our breakthroughs are not that. Our breakthroughs are, and you can write this down, are the result of godly habits over an extended period of time. And I get people all the time, Jason, is there a faster way? <laughs> no, there's not. Hey, let me give it to you this way. Knowledge can come quickly. Wisdom cannot be microwaved. Amen. I want you to hear that. You can gain information, but the application of it and the correct application of it cannot be microwaved. And the same is true of our spiritual life. Our spiritual growth can't be microwaved. You don't get to nuke it and jump ahead. And so our thematic goal for this year, which we started working on and praying on four months ago, is all about spiritual disciplines, spiritual habits, spiritual growth, because we want you to develop the things that are going to make sure that a year from now, you don't look the same as you do spiritually today. And if you'll commit to it, you'll get there. This may be not a sexy series, but it is going to be a super practical series for your spiritual growth. We want to take you into the weight room and start working out every part. Now, we're going to work on how to read the Word of God, how to pray, how to worship, how to be, how, how to, how to be generous with what God, the resources God's given us. Like all these different spiritual disciplines and habits, how do we do those things correctly? What we don't want to do is we're not trying to just build up one thing in your life. You need all of these for spiritual health. <coughs> Excuse me. Like, give me. Let me give you an example. Like, I, I love going to the gym. Don't go as often as, as I like to. 
But I, but I, I love going to the gym, and there was a guy that I kept seeing in the summer, and I don't know if you've seen a guy like this. Like We've all seen the guy at the gym who's all upper body, and his legs look like toothpicks, and he's just weird. Like, like we've all seen that guy, but this guy was even beyond weird from that, okay? Like, he had small legs, small chest, small stomach, small shoulders, small forearms, and massive biceps. Like, that's all. Like, he's just, I'm, I'm watching him, and like, week after week, I'm watching him do no less than like eight to ten just bicep workouts and I wanted to walk up to him so bad like bro it is time to move to muscle group two like like like, like, like you gotta you gotta move on into something else you, your, your arms are gonna be swollen you just look weird like that's how we tend to try, try to function our spiritual life as we go well I'm not gonna read the word of God I'm not gonna pray uh, I'll get my worship on though man that's not healthy we need all of it and that's what we're gonna be focused on so let me give you a rule for life that I want you to hear. Coming out of Galatians, we're going to jump around in Galatians a little bit today. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, the Bible says this, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. Let me break that text down to you real quick, just kind of understand. What he's saying is, I'm about to give you a rule, and this is the way God designed the world to work, and you don't get to get around it. That's what he means when he says, don't mock the justice of God. He goes, I'm about to give you a hard and fast rule for living, and you don't, there's no way to get around it. And he goes like this, you will always harvest what you plant. Every time Paul does spiritual growth talk in Scripture, he always either uses farming or fighting as his illustration. Like, I feel like today he would have been a huge fan of the UFC, or he would have been a huge fan of, like, FarmersOnly.com. Like, that would have been, like, Paul's thing. And he's saying, you can't plant one thing... And then harvest something else. It's illogical. As a matter of fact, for some of us, here's what we tend to do. Uh, like you look at, like you might look at your yard, your front yard, your backyard, and you go, man, if there's no grass, it's just mud. And you go, man, I really want grass in my yard in the spring. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go inside, and I'm going to cross my fingers, and I'm just going to hope grass shows up. <laughs> You're in Texas. I'm going to tell you what's going to show up. Weeds. <laughs> hope is not a strategy. Hope is a starting place. And so I want you to hear this. If you want that to happen, you know what you need to do? You need to go put some seed down or some sod down in your yard. And you need to put some fertilizer down in your yard. You need to let that stuff take root. You need to water that stuff on a daily basis. You need to daily do things if you want the result that you're shooting for. If you go, man, I want an apple tree in my yard. Well, we're going to get our family together. We're going to hold hands. And we're going to march around the perimeter of our fence seven times and just claim an apple tree in the name of Jesus. You're probably not going to get an apple tree, okay? Unless while you were doing that, one of your little kids went and planted a seed. And then later on, they're like, Daddy, look, a miracle. I mean, like, like that's, you're going to have to do some stuff and some daily disciplines in order to get there. You need daily habits. Aristotle said it this way. We are what we repeatedly do. That's why my stomach looks like a bowl of queso. Because I am all, I am what I repeatedly eat, okay? Like, that's what happens. Here's another way, and I want you to write this down. We form habits, but our habits also end up forming us. And this applies to you. You don't, you don't get to go, well, that doesn't apply to me. Like, you can be like, you know what? I don't agree with the law of gravity. Fine. But if you jump out of a plane, it's going to send you towards the ground, whether you agree with it or not. The principle applies to you. The principle of sowing or putting seed in the ground and harvesting something, it applies to you. So what are you sowing? This isn't neutral. Every person in this room right now is sowing something. Your thought life is sowing something. The words you say is sowing something. The behaviors of your life, the actions and attitudes of your life are going to sow something. I'll give you a couple of examples. If you plant anger in your heart, if everything that comes out of you is angry, if every frustration from you is angry, if everything that happens to you goes on Facebook as an angry rant, if everything like that happens, you're going to harvest alienation. People are going to distance from you, and then you're going to get mad at them because no one wants to be close to you, but you are reaping what you sowed. You need to understand that discouragement harvests loneliness. If you're constantly discouraged about yourself and you constantly discourage other people, they will start to move away from you. And then you'll feel isolated and go, why does no one care? Because you sowed 
discouragement and you've harvested loneliness. If you plant envy in your heart, well, why do they get this? How come they get to do this? How come this good thing happened in their life? If you, if you let that envy and comparison be what you plant in your life, you are going to harvest nothing but discontentment. You'll be happy with nothing because you planted envy and discontentment in your life. If passivity is what you plant, well, I need to do something about my marriage, but mm, I, don't, I don't want to do it. I need to do something about my spiritual life, but that seems like a lot of work. I should probably take a stand for something at work or at school, but eh. if you put the seed of passivity into your life, you're going to harvest regret. That's what's going to come out of your life. Now, the cool part is that the positive also applies. So if you put seeds of gratitude, you're going to harvest contentment. If you just sit around every day and start praising God for what you're thankful for, you're going to start being more thankful for the stuff you're thankful for. It's amazing what happens. If you encourage other people, you're going to harvest connections. Because let me tell you something. If you go, man, I don't have a lot of friends, start encouraging people. Because I'll tell you, it has the, uh, the exact opposite effect of discouragement. When you start encouraging, people want to gravitate towards you. And you suddenly have connections. When you plant a seed of joy in your life, you're going to begin to harvest perseverance. You're going to be able to sustain through things. And when you plant the Word of God in your life, which we're going to talk about all next week, and I am fired up about it. You plant the word of God in your life, you're going to reap the power of God in your life. The harvest of the power of God will come out of your life. It's going to be awesome. You reap what you sow. This isn't in your notes, but I want you to write this down. Hopefully this makes sense to you. What you starve in your life will die, but what you feed in your life will thrive. You guys with me, 930? All right, here we go. We're moving on. Let's say it again. All right, here we go. What you starve in your life will die, and what you feed in your life will thrive. All right. Now, chapter 6, verse 8. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desire will harvest decay and death from their sinful nature. Now, that sounds stern. He's saying, man, if you, if you, if you harvest only decay and death, uh, it's going to go really, really bad for your life. And it almost sounds like a threat, like God's going, oh, if you do this, bad stuff will happen. It's not a threat. It's a warning. There's a difference between the two. It, it, when, you're, when you're a parent of small kids and, and, and all of a sudden you, you pull up into uh, your driveway at home or you pull up into a store and you um, put the car in park and you get out. Listen, little kids are um, dumb. Okay, like They're just dumb. They don't know stuff about the world and understand how cars work all the time. And, 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 and you've ever had that moment where they run out into the road or towards the road and you freak out. What do you do as a parent? You start yelling, right? Is it because you hate the child? No. No. It sounds like anger, but it's motivated by love. It's a warning for protection. And that's what God is doing here. He moves on and says this. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So I just want you to get this. This is so cool. He's saying when you plant good stuff in your life, whatever you plant in your life that is practical and natural, God will help you harvest from it something supernatural. Whatever you plant is going to, when you plant the right stuff, it blows up bigger in your life than it was when it started. Small seeds produce huge trees. And that's the principle that God is saying. He goes, man, you plant the right stuff, you're going to be amazed at what comes out of your life. In order to do that, you have to live to please the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, we're going to bounce around in Galatians again. Galatians 5.17 is going to give us an explanation of that. He says this, The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature wants. So he says there's two things in your, in your life, in your heart, in your insides that are at war with each other. They're kind of duking it out inside you. One is my sin nature, and the other one is my spirit nature. And he goes, man, my godliness and my sinful nature, they're just kind of going at each other. And it says these two forces are constantly fighting. You ever felt that in your life? You, you ever had that moment where you were like, I want to quit doing this thing. And I cannot. I know it's wrong, but I can't stop. That's what he's talking about. He's saying this stuff is battling it out. And the role of the Holy Spirit, to live a life of the Spirit, he's saying the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict us and to push us. Now the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. 
I don't know if you know much about it. In systematic theology, it's called the study of pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. And, and so when you get into that, one of the things that's interesting is the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not some sort of weird goo that you walk into and out of. It's, it's not that. It's not the force. It's a person. It's the person of God living inside of me. And the role of that person of God living inside of me is to convict me of what I do wrong and push me to what I should do right. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. But he's not going to twist your arm. And so what Galatians will tell you is if you ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that voice gets harder and harder to hear. You start to struggle. He starts to feel distant. His voice begins to be unrecognizable when I ignore him. But when I listen to what the Holy Spirit says and I do what he prompts me to, I begin to hear him clearly. He feels close to me. That's why when people come to me and go, I just don't feel God anymore. I go, well, when God's asked you to do something in the past, have you done it? Well, no. Well, you're starting to diminish the voice. You, you're just going to listen to the wrong voice. And, and it's just like any other thing. You get into a crowded house at Christmas time. I mean, you, you ever have that experience where everybody can be talking, but, but your mama says something in the other room, and all of a sudden your ears go, like, I heard her over everybody else. That voice was clear. I knew it. Well, that's what it's like to respond to the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is, when, you, when you're not focused on that voice, everything just becomes this noise and you can't pick it out. And so we need to understand the role of the Holy Spirit. Because God wants not just to keep you from bad, but he wants to produce something good in you. It's not just keep me from sin, it's do something. And so what will you harvest <clears throat> if you do this correctly? Chapter 5, verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Now, this is one of those texts that drives me uh, insane. It's amazing what we turn into children's things in church. Like Noah and the ark, the guy in the boat and the rainbow. You know, when the whole world died. I mean, like, like that's... <laughs> Joe to kids, it's going to be great. David and Goliath, hey, remember that time when they got the rock right through the guy's forehead and killed him? And then they cut his head off and stood there with it on the spear? Challenge ministry. Like, like that's, it's a weird thing that we do with kids' stories. But this is one of those that gets, kind of gets pushed into VBS time. But this is really what God wants to produce in our adult, mature, spiritual lives through our daily habits. He says this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. So we plant, we harvest. When we plant the right stuff, we harvest this. Love, joy, peace. Come on. Patience, oh Lord. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many of you need a little more of one or two of those in your life? Yeah. Why would you not want more of those in your life? That's what God wants for you. Let me, let me tell you how C.S. Lewis said this. I love this quote. He says this. He says, good and evil both increase at compound interest. I love that. Little decisions that we make every day are of such infinite importance. Stay with me. The smallest good act today, a few months later, enables you to go on to victories that you could have never dreamed of. And then check this out. An indulgence in lust or anger today is the bridgehead from which the enemy may launch an attack that would have been otherwise impossible. What he's saying is, when we live according to the right kinds of habits. It produces victories in us that we couldn't have imagined. But when we live in bad habits, it actually gives our enemy a platform in our life to attack us. That's such a great thought. See, the harvest principle can work for you or against you. You're going to plant something and you're going to harvest something and it can either go good for you or bad based on what you plant. Like you, uh, we go back to the, the, the image of, of gravity. You jump out of a plane Gravity immediately begins to work against you. Now, as you're careening towards the earth, you can sit there and go, I don't believe in gravity. It's going to end badly for you, though. Whether you acknowledge it or not, your other option, pull a ripcord, and all of a sudden, gravity, the very thing that was opposing you, begins to work in your favor. And that's what God is telling us about this principle, is that it can work for you or against you. And let me tell you what I think we need to do in order for it to work for us. Number one, and, and listen, we need to start playing offense. Hey, here's the deal, man. I, I, I'm, here's what we manage in our church and in other churches all the time. We manage people's spiritual lives who are only playing defense. 
Let me tell you what that looks like for you. I get the most focused, the most into the Word of God, the most into the worship when my life is falling apart. And then the moment my life's not falling apart, I'm no longer doing those things. You're playing defense. You're not offensively preparing your life to do battle. You are simply waiting till life happens to you and then running to God, which is a good thing in that moment. But what if you could play with an offensive mindset from the beginning? What might change in those dark moments of your life? We need to begin to play offense. Here, when we play defense, here's what it looks like. We go, um, well, Jason, there's no big sins in my life, so I really don't need to focus too much on these spiritual habits. Um, in a marriage, you don't have to have an affair for the marriage to be bad. Just because you're not doing the worst thing doesn't mean you've created something healthy and positive. And that's what the Bible is going to tell us. And so God says, play offense because he wants to be an advocate for you, for you to produce fruit in your life, not just avoid sin. Stay with me on that, okay? God wants to produce something good in your life and not just avoid the bad stuff. Too often in church, we're preaching against all the bad stuff, which is good, but we're not pushing you towards the fact that God actually wants to produce something good in you. And so I want you to hear this. Excuse me. In chapter 6, verse 9, he says this. Because Paul knows that living this daily habit is hard. And so he says this. Let's not get tired of doing what's good. Anybody ever walk in your faith in, in the Lord? And man, it, sometimes it just takes a long time for the harvest. And you go, man, I am just tired. Yeah. He says, don't get tired of doing what's good at just the right time. Yeah. You will reap a harvest of blessing if, what? We don't give up. And so that's, the, that's the, one of the last two things I want to tell you is, is don't give up. Whatever's happening in your life, you know, listen, we know this intellectually. Things grow at different rates. People grow at different rates. Hearts change at different speeds. So a lot of times we're, we're, we're planting and we're planting and we're planting and we're planting and we're going, man, when am I going to see some fruit, Jason? I get it. And I wish I could give you a date and I wish I could give you a time, but I can't. What I can tell you from this verse is that God has a right time and the right time is the best time. And that's what I need you to know. So don't give up. I was doing some research on farming as I got into this message, which is not something I normally research. And I got into this article about a bamboo farmer. And I didn't know this. When you plant bamboo, it takes five years for it to start growing. Start growing. And so here, here was the crazy thing. I started thinking, what would it have been like to be the first bamboo farmer? <laughs> like you go home to your wife and you go, sweetie, we're selling everything. I got an idea. We live over here in China. They use bamboo for stuff. Those resources are dwindling. We are going to be the first bamboo farm. It's going to be amazing. We are about to get loaded. You are going to have everything you've ever dreamed of, sweetie. Here's where we're going. And she goes, babe, oh, babe, I love you. I trust you. Let's go for it. And he, first bamboo farmer, has no idea how long this stuff takes. So he plants in the ground. At the end of year one, his wife comes and goes, my love, my hero, my prince. Take me out to our fields of bamboo. Let me see the work, the investment that we have made. And he takes her out there. And there's nothing. He goes, she's like, you know, do you forget where you planted it? Like, what, like, what happened? There's nothing here. He's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the deal is. That's, um, nothing ha- nothing's happened yet. But he keeps watering. He keeps working. By the end of year two, she's like, anything? He's like, no. Now she's starting to get angry. Frustrated. By the time year four hits, she's just getting sarcastic. And I would too. Like he comes home and she's like, hey, sweetie, how was it at your imaginary bamboo farm? Like how did that go for you today? Did you have a good day at work at the imaginary bamboo farm? Because while you were gone, I imagined that I did laundry and I imaginary made dinner. And later on, we can have imaginary sex. It's going to be fantastic. And then, at the end of year five, he didn't give up. And do you know what happens after year five? 
in six weeks' time, this thing that took five years goes from nothing to 90 feet. When we don't give up at just the right time, you get to do what this farmer did and look at your wife and go, how do you like me now, baby? <laughs> you want imaginary or the real thing? Let's go! So some of you guys go, man, I've been planting, I've been watering, I've been fertilizing, and I don't have anything to show for it yet. Here would be my encouragement. Don't give up. Keep planting. Keep fertilizing. Keep staying in your daily habits. And do this. Write this down. Trust that God will harvest something if you do not give up. Trust in that. And so the second thing I want you to write under these points is start somewhere. And I want to go through this very quickly with you. So stay with me. I want to ask you to do something. Now, this is what I believe God wants for your life, but this is the challenge that as a church we are going to undergo. And so here's the thing. I believe God wants you to give Him the first of your year. And here's what I mean by that. I want you to commit right now that as we go through this year and we focus on spiritual habits, as we focus on spiritual disciplines, I want you to say, I'm all in. That I'm going to give the next 52 weeks to God. And here's what I promise you. I promise you. That if you're willing to say, Jason, I will go all in for one year of my life. And one year from now, your spiritual life will look drastically different than it does today. Yeah. I don't care where you are right now. God will move you to a place you couldn't have imagined if you will simply say, I'm in. I will commit whatever that looks like. And then I want to ask you to give God the first of your month. And here's what I mean by that. Your scheduling and your budget. Yeah, now, let me hit the budget one first, because I'm not talking about, this is not, if, you, if you're new here, this is not a give money to crossroads moment. Here's what I believe about this. That we so often disregard what the Bible says about our own personal finances, that the greatest cause of depression, of divorce, of suicide is financial struggles, because we've mismanaged the resources of God in our life, and then we feel unfulfilled, because when God shows up and says, here's an opportunity for you to be generous to this neighbor, to this friend, to this coworker, we cannot, because we've mismanaged the resources of God. Yeah. And so if we would apply the principles of God... What would your life look like if you just said monthly, I'm going to give what God asked me to give to him first? Whatever that looks like. And that may be rearranging priorities in my life. But also manage your schedule. We, we fill up, the man, our, we, our schedules fill up with everything except God that fast, don't they? Yeah. Can I just ask you at the beginning of the month to sit down with your spouse, by yourself, with your parents, whatever you need to do and go, what are we going to do this month to get some specific time to God? Could you do that? The next thing I want you to give the first of is I want you to give the first of your week to God. So you're going all in for the year. I'm going to focus my schedule and my budget, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to get my week started. I don't know if you know this, but there's a couple of different reasons why the Sabbath in church tradition moved from Saturday to Sunday. And one of the major ones was that because Sunday was considered the start of the week, and the Christians wanted us to start the week focused on God. I do not, for the life of me, understand why people do not prioritize time with God at church in the Word. Man, I love coming and seeing you guys. I love when God speaks. I don't like to miss. Well, when Wes is preaching, man, I always want to be here. When I was gone <coughs> and I was sick that week, as soon as that thing went up online, I wanted to, to see what was going on there because I wanted, I wanted that to be preached to me. And I love being filled up like that. And so I want you to commit to start the first of your week in church. I don't care if it's this church. We are not here to build crossroads. You want to come here? Great. But there's a ton of amazing churches in this area, and most of them have way better preaching. And so I just want to encourage you guys, I don't care where you go, go somewhere and let God speak to you. Let your first year week be filled with a Sunday morning experience with God and a connect group. Man, I can't, I can't stress that enough. In your handout this week, there's a list of connect groups. I just want to encourage you. There's one that was missing. It's a Saturday night group. We'll put it in there for next week. But if you're free only on Saturday nights, there's a group for you. Um, if you're going, man, I want to be in a connect group, but I'm terrified of going to somebody's house on Monday nights, not tomorrow, but starting a week from tomorrow. Right here in this room on Monday nights, my wife and I will host our on-site group. And so get in one of those. But then the fourth and final thing is can I just encourage you to give God the first of your day? 
I want to encourage you to give 15 minutes, broken down into five minute segments. And here's what I mean five minutes in the Word, five minutes in prayer, five minutes in worship. 15 minutes. You go, Jason, you don't understand. I get up at 5 30. Get up at 5 15. I know you go, well, that's a lot to ask. I realize that. But listen, our daily habits are what's going to be the end result for us. And so it might be worth the 15 minutes. And somebody will go, well, I'll do it at lunch. Or I'll do it later in the day. How many times have you told yourself that and never got around to it? I, mean, I do it all the time. The moment you put it off. And so I'm going to tell you, before you ever pick up this thing in the morning and start looking at it, because some of you guys are A-type personalities. If I look at my iPhone and there's a bunch of red bubbles with numbers on them, my brain is gone at that point because I've got to clear red dots off my phone. And so before you even look at this thing, pick up one of these. And spend some time. And, and I'm going to get into that much deeper next week about how to do that, how to understand it. But um, we want to help you out. And so on our, on our website, if you will look at our main banner page, uh, in the middle, there's this one called Daily Devotions. If you click on that, it's going to take you to a page that looks like this. It'll say January 15th, Monday. That's tomorrow morning. And it's going to give you a very brief little thing, some text that you can read, a couple of quick questions. Very simple. And if you scroll down, it's going to give you all of this week on that site. Now, if you go, well, Jason, I don't get onto websites very much. Everything I do is on my phone. If you've never done this, we have an app for our church. If you go into Android or to um, the Apple Store, you can, you can look for Crossroads Rowlett. That's the app. Download the app, and there's a devotions page. And those will be uploaded daily for you. And so you may go, I already have a reading plan. I already have a thing I do. Fine. I'm not asking you to change that. But statistically... 93% of you do not have a daily reading plan. That's the statistics. And so I'm saying, that's a five-minute thing. Five minutes. Create a different habit. We want you to do that, and we're going to have 21 days of this to start. Why 21 days? Because they say now that it takes 21 days to start a habit or 21 days to end a habit. And so we want to give you the chance to do that. We want you to start a new habit. We want to be creatures of habit because we want to look like Christ. And I'm going to tell you the reason we want to do that is because we believe it has a spiritual impact in our lives, our family's lives, in our city's lives. And that's what we want to be. You guys up for that? Okay. We've got one life to live and that's the kind of church I want to live mine in. I hope that's true for you as well.